So uh, we're starting uh, a, a different phase of the festivities, uh, beginning to um, tap into Shaul students. And it's my pleasure to introduce Udi Zahari, who's now at Hebrew University, Representations of Space for Action in Human Motor Pathways. And by the way, don't read, don't believe the time exactly on your blue handouts. Uh, Udi will be speaking for 40 minutes and also do. So I heard I'm supposed to speak for 40 minutes like a minute ago. So hopefully I'll finish in 30 minutes and then we'll have time for <laughs> questions. But don't count on it. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here, Show. I've been three months in Stanford and came back because I thought I couldn't miss this. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I just thought everyone reminiscing about something they've had with Shaul, and I had the blackout. <laughs> but uh, a lot of the names that I'll mention today as I go are people that I've met as a young PhD student. I just arrived in Shaul's lab, I think it was 1980, 25 years ago, something of the sort. And it was a Batsheva seminar. And we had Mickey Goldberg and Ann Triesman and Michael Posner and uh, who else? I'm Bob Wurtz and Bob Bezemon, and a lot of these names I'll uh, mention as I go today. Not all of them, but a, a lot of them. And it was great. I mean, it was such a great experience that uh, I remember it 25 years later. And it just, so 25 years have passed, and I feel it's like it's been yesterday. And I'm worried, what does it mean in the next 25 years? But that's it. <laughs> and OK, I'd better get started, so I'll finish on time, and I'll, I'll have some stories as I go. So my talk today is uh, about representations of uh, space for action in the human motor pathways. And I usually mention the names initially because I always forget way, when it's time to mention them in the end. So the work has been done really by, uh, there's two pieces of work I'm going to talk about. Uh, part of the work is going to be about limb movement. Another part is going to be about the ocular motor system. In the ocular motor system, the work has been done by a student of mine, Yoni Pertsov, who was jointly uh, supervised by myself. And my first PhD student, Galia Vidan, who's now in uh, Ben Gurion University. So that's uh, a pleasure in itself. And the other two students, Lior Shmuelov and Michal Eisenberg, uh, were uh, students who did the work on the limb movement, together with uh, Elon Vaadia uh, from the Hadassah uh, Medical School. And uh, basically, how do I, a visual person, end up talking about the modal pathways? Well, part of it is due to Ellen Vadia, and part of it is also due, I think, to the zeitgeist and uh, how things evolve in uh, the ICNC at the time. Because Tali, I've heard Tali quite a few times, and this idea of interaction between perception of, uh, and action somehow feeds into the system whether you want it or not. So you end up doing uh, work on the topic, uh, uh, even if you didn't mean to in the beginning. So let me tell you the uh, story uh, from the start. And basically, I want to start with a classical view. So this is basically a picture that I took off. This is from 2011. I just Googled and asked for images of uh, motor cortex and visual cortex or something of a sort. And this is the picture that I got. And this is, of course, a classical picture in which you show the visual area and, of course, in the visual cortex, which is responsible for what's in the scene and where are the important targets for action. And then there's the motor uh, cortex, primary motor cortex, uh, in which you think about this as important for determining how to act on these targets. And you say that there's somewhere in between the, what's called association cortex. So you see it's sensory association area and the auditory association area. So in the association cortex, and, and this is what the classical view from, I don't know, 50 or decades ago was, OK, this is the area in which you have to generate the transformations between the visual representation to the motor ones. Because, of course, people have realized long ago that the visual representation initially is in retinal coordinates, and eventually the motor action is going to be in effector-based coordinates. So you have to have this transformation. And, of course, this is generally right. Of course, if you have a lesion in visual cortex, you're rendered blind. And if you have a lesion in part of the hand part of the motor cortex, you have a problem of moving the contralateral limb. But uh, I, I would claim that it's, it, it's missing uh, a general feature, because it's sort of suggesting uh, that there's sort of a, a pathway going from 
the visual cortex up to the motor cortex, and that's it. And action's done. And of course, we know that the whole story is that it's not so, that there's a loop. And, the, and vision, perception, and action are uh, basically uh, involved in a continuous loop. And uh, there's a continuous interaction between the two. And as uh, you'll hear from Tali, I think, this evening, uh, this is a, a figure from Joaquin Fuster, who I think also was in this, if I remember correctly, also was in this uh, Batsheva seminar, uh, who mentions this uh, sort of uh, scheme where there's continuous interaction between the motor, as the, the motor areas and the uh, visual areas. And uh, of course, the problem is that when you think about the communities, this is, you know, I, I, I plotted this in red and, and blue, and not uh, for, I had a reason for this, because, or P Fuster did, and I thought, well, this, is, this actually fits in. I was thinking about the last elections in, in the state. You know, I've just been in the state for three months, and there's no talk between the red, next maybe, the reds, <laughs> and the blues, right? And, and, and of course, uh, this also is, is something that we can see in uh, the neuroscience. There's the motor new neuroscience community and a visual neuroscience community. Now, there's some people who are involved in the two, maybe uh, Mickey Goldberg, Bob Woods. There are a few names who are actually interested, especially in the ocular motor system, because you can't avoid this. But in ge generally speaking, they have a different jargon. The two communities have a different jargon. And I think that it generates a, a problem that you underestimate the contribution of visual elements in motor brain areas. And this is where I want to. Uh, come and, um, and present some stuff from our lab. And the main point I want to make in my talk is that motor areas in the human brain contain information both on action aspects, as you would think, but also about the visual context. Where are the targets in space? So actually, going after Mickey Goldberg, maybe uh, it's redundant because, I mean, he's shown this so beautifully in LIP. I'll try to show that you see some some features like this also in primary motor cortex. Now, primary mo motor cortex may be used because you think about this as a gateway of the motor uh, commands going down, uh, downstream to uh, um, spinal cord and, and activate, actually activating the uh, motor neurons, or at least 1% of them do. And anyway, so I want to start with, with the classics. And the classics, of course, I think is a work by Georgiopoulos uh, from the early 80s. And this also reminds me of something. I have 10 more minutes. I have time to speak about all this reminiscence uh, of mine. When we started, when, before ICNC days, you heard here that there was a, a period where we sort of had uh, joint meetings of the physicists together, Daniel Mit and, and Chaim and, and Elon Vadia was there and, and Moshe Abeles and also Shaul Hochstein. And I was a young PhD student, so I joined it. And one of the, the papers we discussed was the work of Dijopoulos. And I'll get to this in a minute. But OK, so Djokovic had this uh, task, which actually Elon Vadia is using till now, or some versions of this has used till very recently, in which you basically uh, train a monkey. Here's the monkey's hand. What he has to do is movement in a pla planar uh, direction, in, in eight different directions along the plane. And here are the trajectories. And uh, at the same time, uh, Djokovic and his colleagues have recorded from uh, primary motor cortex, M1. And basically, I think you've all seen this, so I'm, I'm going through this very quickly. You find that uh, neurons in M1 are tuned to the direction of motion. So here's uh, the uh, direction tuning of uh, uh, this specific neuron. So it prefers motion up, uh, sorry, uh, left and forward. Okay, so this would be its preferred direction. I don't know, 140 degrees or something of the sort. And of course, uh, I'm mentioning Georgiopoulos' work because when we met together, what we talked about was this. And this was not just looking at the single cell, but looking at a population vector. So it was one of the first, I think it's a seminal uh, work, because it was one of the first papers to indicate that you shouldn't let, look just at the tuning of single neurons, but you should look at sort of the combined activity of all of them together. And the idea here was that each neuron is basically voting to its preferred direction. If you take the population code, you get a reasonably accurate uh, vector of the actual movement of the, uh, of the monkey. And OK, so I think to summarize this, monkeys in M1 show sensitivity to the direction of motion. So it's beyond just force, and, and uh, which was thought to be the you know, major uh, contributor to the activity in, in neurons in M1. 
but also the, po the population uh, vector can accurately predict limb action. Now, okay, this is all nice, but here's something that people have, I think, in general, left behind. And, and that is the fact that when the monkey is actually making these movements, he has to make movements to a visual target. So this being primary motor cortex, people have, I think, basically assumed implicitly that, okay, activity in this area must reflect the motor components. So it's either direction, the magnitude, the speed of the motion, but they're all motor aspects, and the visual aspects are irrelevant, okay? But, of course, the monkey is doing a task in which there are v uh, visual targets, and he's, uh, he's seeing also the trajectory of the cursor, so the visual aspect could be relevant. And so this is where we started, and we wanted to study the nature of representation of limb motion in human M1 using uh, functional MRI. So this is work that was started by Lior Shmuelov and continued by uh, Michal Eisenberg. And the idea here is to use the joystick, which is uh, MRI compatible, and have a task in which subjects first hold the so uh, joystick upright, then one of the targets come up, comes up and it's different in color than the other, and this signals the target. And then uh, after there's a go signal, in which the uh, joystick, sorry, the central uh, circle here changes its color to white. This indicates to the subject that they can move the joystick, they can make the joystick movement. And they make the joystick movement, and then another trial starts, and another, and so on and so forth. And uh, so that's what you see here. And basically, when we look at the trajectories, the, tra the trajectories are uh, fine, so we can record the trajectories as well inside the scanner. And now we're interested in what happens in the motor cortex. So we're focusing here on primary motor cortex. So here it is in the central circle, the limb area of the primary motor cortex. And here's an example of one such voxel in primary motor cortex. So it looks quite arbitrary. But if you're using uh, the right uh, model to extract, basically a deconvolution me uh, measure to extract the contribution to each, uh, or the, if you want, the hemodynamic response to each direction of motion, you suddenly find that, of course, it's a delayed response. It peaks at around six uh, seconds. Uh, and, but what you can see is that there is, is some degree of um, tuning in the voxel. So I pointed, uh, I plotted here where, okay, so for the, the 45 degree, there's a highest uh, signal. And for the zero degrees, there's a low signal. So there's some tuning at the level of the voxel. Okay, now this in itself is, is, is news, right? Because if, if the voxel contains of the order of million neurons and they're uniformly distributed, you shouldn't expect this. And the only way to, or one uh, plausible way to understand this is that within a voxel you have columns and there's just, instead of a million neurons, you can think about this as a few tens of columns. And once you have a few tens of columns, you could have just by luck that within this voxel there's more columns to the 45 degrees and the others, and therefore you get this voxel tuning. So, but besides this, once you have this voxel tuning, you can start thinking again about, okay, a population code. And the population code is what we call a multi-voxel uh, pattern of activation. So you're looking at the activation across these uh, multiple voxels, and you're asking, okay, now can you decode what was the direction of movement of the hand based on this multi-voxel pattern? So here we are. What we do is we have many repetitions of the same, uh, the same movement. And this is the pattern that you get for a movement 90 degrees. And you divide the, the, the pattern to odd trials and even trials, so it's half and half. And what you look now is that the correlation between the pattern of activation for the odd trials and the even trials for the same movement. So you see that this correlation of, is of the order of uh, 0.27. It's not great, OK, because the signal in the MRI is rather noisy, but if you were to keep the subject, instead of uh, uh, an hour in the scanner, you do this for 10 hours, of course, the correlation would go up because it's just, you would average out the scanner noise to some extent. Okay, now if you do this for 180 degrees, you get another number, and this is just an example. So, uh, and now you can do, of course, the correlation between the odd trials for 90 degree movement and the even trials for 180 degrees movement, and what you get, basically, you can get, think of a matrix of the uh, basic uh, correlation matrix of the activation patterns in the even trials versus the activation patterns in the odd trials. And of course, the main diagonal would be the replication of the same movements, and the ones off diagonal would be movements that differ by a, a 
greater degree as the, the colors here do change from uh, black to gray and to shades of gray to white. Okay, and here are the numbers, basically, and when you average across all of these, across subjects, uh, you get the following sort of uh, tuning curve, so it's a correlation, okay, so it's the correlation coefficient, the degree of similarity between the patterns when the movement is the, the same, and so the angular difference between the two, the angular distance would be zero, and as the angular distance increases, the, the movements are differing, so the, the greater the, the difference, the uh, less there is a correlation, it actually drops to a negative value. Okay, so that's nice, you get some uh, uh, mapping of the uh, movements in terms of the similarity. Okay, but I want to get back to the question I've asked, and that is to separate the effect of visual and motor factors in M1. And to do this, we actually utilize uh, basically a paradigm that Elon has been using a long time, and I think this has been uh, even earlier than Elon. You're not the first one, you know, this is called Claude Getz or something like that who has actually used this in, in the 80s. So the idea is the following. Basically, you start with, with what I've described. You have a first block, what's called a sta standard task, where you do what I just uh, described uh, a minute ago. And then what you have is a second block, but between the first and second block, you introduce a short learning. And the learning is such that now you're moving the hand forward. The cursor doesn't go forward, but the cursor goes in a different direction. So if you're moving your hand to the right, the cursor goes right and up. Okay? So you're introducing a 45 difference degree, uh, degree difference between the actual cursor movement and the, ac and the actual limb movement, the hand movement. Okay? And okay, great, but what, what's it good for? Well, it's good for because now you can separate the motor aspects and the visual aspects. And the idea is the following. You can take the uh, uh, pattern of activation that you got during the standard run, and now you have a, uh, the subjects have learned, it takes about five to 10 minutes for them to learn this, and now you run the rotation run after they've learned this. So we're not looking at learning effects, we're looking at post-learning effects, okay? And now you can align the two movements in terms of the motor component, or you can uh, align the two movements in terms of the visual component. And remember, the visual and the motor component are not the same, okay? So the, you, you create different alignments. And there's also two controls you have to uh, do. I'm not gonna get into it, but if we get to the questions, I can explain what they are. And now you look at, okay, the pattern of activation that you get for the standard uh, movement, that's at 90 degree. And for the uh, rotation trial, so the standard, okay, the movement and the, uh, visual aspects are, are aligned. And in rotation trials, okay, now it's the motor aspects that are aligned and the visual aspects are not aligned. And you get a given uh, correlation for the two. You do this for the visual, when you get a, a different number, and this is just an example, and now you do this for the two controls and you get negative correlation uh, values, and you can do this uh, across uh, directions and across subjects. And basically this is the uh, uh, main, uh, uh, result that we have here, what you can see is that when the two components are aligned along the motor axis, if it's only motor con mo the motor uh, aspects which, which are uh, relevant, you'd expect this to be high, the correlation between these should be high, but you find that if you align the two along the visual axis, you get also a significant positive correlation. It's not quite as high as the motor one, but it's highly significant compared to its c control. So what I'd like to uh, end up in saying here is that M1 act activation is related both to the motor and the visual aspects of the, uh, of the limb action. But what visual aspects are the relevant ones? So it could be the trajectory of the limb motion. This is what I would th think initially, okay? Because usually we're using vision to control our movements. But notice here that subjects don't see their own uh, hand. What they see is the movement of the trajectory the, the target and the movement of the, of the trajectory on the screen. So it couldn't be a reafferent sensory signal. You see, movements are of the cursor, not the hand. So what I uh, argue is that it's most likely to be, well, the relevant parameter would be the position of the cue or the target, and it's most likely to reflect spatial memory, uh, probably not motor intention, because I wrote here motor intention, but this is wrong. It's actually spatial memory or spatial attention. It's not a motor intention because remember, let's just go back to make this clear, that you ha if you actually have, have to uh, make a, uh, a movement to get to there, to there, you actually have to plan a motor movement which is different. So it couldn't be a motor attention because it's not the same motor movement. 
Okay, so it's more likely to uh, encode the position of the of the queue or the target, uh, and uh, it should probably reflect spatial memory or spatial attention. We could talk about this later. So, just to uh, interim summary here, the multi-voxel pattern in human M1 shows direction selectivity, and it displays sensitivity both to the motor and the visual aspects of the task. Now, another. Uh, experiment that we've done, and I'll just briefly mention this, is that the selectivity is only observed when perception is coupled with action. So if you're now seeing the same cursor movements, but you're not making any joystick movements, you're just basically doing a playback of what has been done just by the same uh, subject a few minutes ago, you find that there is no such selectivity. There's actually very little uh, activation in M1 when you only see the same movement without you doing the action. So the M1 M visual activation is likely to reflect encoding of target position for future action, irrespective of the exact action to be performed. OK, so that's point number one. And uh, I'm leaving now limb movement, and I'm moving to uh, the ocular motor system. And I want to show you that there's parallels. And the idea here is that, OK, when we think about the ocular motor system, the visual input to the cortex in, is encoded in retina topic coordinates. So, of course, if you fixate here, then uh, a given neuron would have a receptive field here. You move to your fixation here, the receptive field moves together with the uh, fixation. And this is a, there's a retina topic mapping in, in, throughout the uh, visual cortex uh, from the retina onwards. And the oculomotor output is also encoded in terms, of, in terms of a vector of movement, okay? So it doesn't really matter where your eye is. What's important is where's your target with respect to your, your eye. So what you have to encode is a vector that would m uh, move your eye from its current position to a new position, okay? So this is exactly uh, the retina topic co coding of future saccadic target offers a simple transformation between the visual and ocular motor representation. So it's nice and easy. It's wonderful in that respect, okay? And this, again, referring to uh, the masters. So back in the, I think, 70s and 80s, there were a group of people who did works like this. Robinson, Wurtz, Mickey Goldberg, and I hope I'm not the Sparks, and I hope I'm not forgetting you know, other important ones. Mickey, fill me in if I'm wrong there. And basically, the story was that uh, they've shown that in the superior collectors, there's a map. And there's an encoding. In one direction, you encode the saccade amplitude. And in the other direction, you encode saccadic uh, direction, okay? So if you are to stimulate neurons that are here, you'd get a saccade, look, it's at zero degrees, so it would be along the horizontal line. And as you're moving from here to here to here to here, in terms of the stimulating electrode, the saccade becomes bigger, okay? So it's an encoding of the vector of the saccade. Uh, the saccade. And uh, so this is a beautiful mapping that was found in superior colliculus. There's some similar uh, uh, mapping in the frontal eye fields. But that's not always enough. So think about it. I'm talking to you now. And it, you would ask me, OK, point to where uh, the, uh, I don't know, uh, the stimulus is in the, in the back of my head. I can't see it. But I can still make a very quick saccade together with the head, head movement towards it, although it's not in my visual field. So of course, any psychologist will tell you, of course, we have a representation of the world besides what we can see right here, OK? And so, and this is something that uh, my clan did not, I'm not sure if it's a, a, a British kitchen or what's, it looks very cramped, but the idea that he was trying to uh, mention here is that when he's washing the dish and he has to make a sort of, to the teapot's now boiling, he can make a, a saccade directly to the teapot uh, here, and, and he knows, and his saccade would be quite accurate, okay? So in that case, of course, the topic coding is not sufficient. And OK, so what are the alternatives? The alternative is, is that we have another mapping which encodes where the, uh, the position of uh, targets are uh, with respect to either the head, the body, or uh, the world. OK, now let's call this spatial topic. I'm not deferring between uh, the two. But, and that would mean that you would sort of encode the end point where you want to get to irrespective of where you started from. OK? Now, here's the. Uh, your, this is the work that was done by Yoni Peretzov. And the question is, can we find any way to distinguish between retinotopic and spatial, uh, spatial topic re uh, reference frames? And Yoni had this uh, 
magnificent, simple idea. Well, okay, let's do it. what we need is basically to have multiple origin points and multiple directions, uh, destinations of saccades. So here we are. There's four different positions where you can start from, and you're making saccade from here. To, well, you see it here. Make it this way, this way, this way, and so on and so forth. Okay, great. Now, what do you get from this? You get from this the uh, uh, option of, okay, so here are the eight different saccades that you can make, and you get from this an option to discriminate between saccades that have the same vector, so the, the blue and the red saccades here have the same vector, okay, so they, uh, according to a retinotopic uh, model, the pattern of activation should be similar for pairs with the same vector but different destination. According to a spatial topic model, you should uh, see that uh, patterns of activation should be similar for pairs with the same destination but, different, but a different defector. Okay, so we designed a task along these lines, and the idea was, okay, it, it, this is called a, um, a long uh, event-related uh, paradigm, so you have a fixation, and then you have a queue, which is a ready queue, and then you have some queue to tell you, okay, what's the next saccad to plan? But you're not allowed to do this. You just plan the saccade, and you wait for the uh, original fixation point to uh, vanish, and this is the goal signal for you to make the saccade. And then, uh, and there's a delay of between seven and a half and 13 and a half seconds, and then you acquire the target here, and, there's a, and then there's a long intertrial interval for the hemodynamic response to go ba back to uh, its original uh, level. And when you do this, you can find that there's uh, numbers of regions of interest which are active for such a, uh, in such a task, not surprising, the frontal eye fields, and uh, three sites in the uh, intraparietal sulcus, which we call, for simplicity, the anterior more one, the middle one, and the posterior one. And what you can see here is the time course. So you see that there's a signal, and depending if it's a, a short interval, medium interval, long interval, the motor response is delayed. Okay? And what we're focusing here is not on the motor response or the visual response, but on the delay response here. And asking, okay, what does the pattern of activity, what is the pattern of activity during this delay period? And the idea is that we don't want to look at the motor component. We want to uh, look at the time when you actually uh, have to remember where the saccade is and possibly also plan, uh, of course, plan the, the saccade for the, 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 the target. And now what we do is look at uh, various areas. So uh, we're starting here at the frontal eye fields. And in the frontal eye fields, we're looking at uh, uh, different comparisons. So the first comparison we do is between saccades that have the same vector and same destination. So they're identical saccades, but we divide them into the uh, odd and even uh, trials. And when you do this, so this is sort of the benchmark. When you do this, you get a correlation between the, the patterns of activity, which is of the order, it's not very high, it's of the 0.13 or something like that. Uh, but it's significantly different than zero, of course. And now, the important comparison. So the first comparison is when you share the same vector, but it's a different destination, so the red and the blue uh, arrow. And in that case, you get somewhat uh, smaller uh, correlation, but it's uh, of the same order. Now, if you look at uh, 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 cases where it's a different vector, but to the same destination, or a different vector and different destination, you get no correlation whatsoever. It's um, basically zero. So you can think of this as sort of a, a step. These two are high, and these two are low. And if you do an analysis of variance, you would find that what's important is the vector in, in the frontal eye fields, and the destination does not, is not a very important uh, factor here. So you see there's basically a two-by-two two sort of parsing of you know, what's important here. Is it vector, these two, or destination, these two? Okay, and they could be either same vector or same destination or different vector and different destination. Okay, so that's the case in the frontal life field. So in the frontal life field, similar to what we've expected, you find that what's important is actually the, the, the saccade vector. But if you look at a different region, and to, to <coughs> cut it short, I'm just presenting the one uh, area where you find a different result. So if you focus in the uh, uh, middle, uh, intraparietal sulcus, what you find is basically you see that this graded uh, effect here. So the highest correlation is for the same vector and same destination, but the same vector and different destination is somewhat lower, 
and the different vector and same destination is higher than when they're completely different. So this grading suggests that if you do the analysis of variance, that it's not only the vector that's important, but also the destination that's important. So what's the story here? You get a, a representation not only of a retinotopic representation, but also a spatiotopic representation. Okay, so the endpoint is also relevant. And again, what's represented in this uh, spatiotopic coordinate frame? So remember, this is at the delay period. It could be saccade preparation, and, but, but uh, we think it's uh, probably not so because you have to prepare a completely different saccade if you're, it's the same endpoint if you're coming from the right or from the left. Okay? It's more likely to be spatial memory or spatial attention. And, okay, so finally we thought, okay, can we think of some uh, psychophysical study or behavioral study to, to, uh, or phenomena that would be uh, relevant for this? So here's where Michael Posner, again a name that was at this original uh, Bacheva seminar, comes in. So Michael Posner, like, uh, I think in that, was it around the 80s where he actually designed this task, had this classical spatial attention task where you have a fixation, you have a cue, and then there's a target appears that either appears at the position of this cue or in the other side, so it's either valid or invalid. You all know this. And what you find is depending on the delay, okay, the time for the goal signal, if it's short, you get a facilitation of the QQ facilitation. But if it's long, there's an inhibition of return. Okay, so it takes you longer, actually, to uh, get to the position where the cue was if it's be beyond something like uh, a few hundred uh, milliseconds or 400 or 500 milliseconds. And the interpretation was that this inhibition of return, or what's called IOR, could be a, a map of inhibitory tags for previously attended locations. You've been there, uh, oh, in simple words, you've been there or you've attended already to this queue. Okay, I, I've known this, I don't want to see, I don't, let's inhibit this, okay? And people have thought about this as a foraging facilitator. And what we thought that if it's, I've been there and I don't want to get back there, it doesn't really matter where your eye is. So the way we thought of designing an experiment is, okay, now let's do the following. Let's have a fixation, present the cue, but then have the subjects make a, uh, a saccade to a new position, okay? So you present the cue, and then you make an intermediate saccade, and finally, you make the final saccade. And what we're looking at is the final saccade, and we're interested, uh, how does the uh, hue affect the final saccade? And okay, so there are four uh, positions of where the final saccade would end. So remember, first you make a saccade to the left, and then you make either sa a saccade to the uh, green point, to the red point, to the white point, or to the uh, blue point. Okay? And if you make a saccade to the green point, this corresponds to the original vector, right? Okay, because the queue was here, and your fixation at that po point when the queue was presented was here. So that's a ve the vector downward and to the right, okay? But if what's important was where the queue was in screen position, then you'd think that what's important, okay, you'd get a stronger inhibition of return for this movement from, uh, the, from here to here, okay? Because now the final target is at the place where the queue was in terms of screen position. And when you actually do this, the, the analysis, so you can uh, compute the saccadic reaction time as a function of, uh, the position, the final uh, uh, saccade, uh, res saccadic response, you find that there's an inhibition of return and it's bigger for a target presented in spatiotopic coordinates than in retinotopic coordinates. And surprisingly, this, uh, uh, you can see this effect and it's strongest when the time, the delay from the uh, end of the intervening saccade is short. So we have the added feature here that we can plan when does the last uh, target appear, okay? So you've made a saccade, and then you've acquired this fixation, and now at different uh, delay periods, we can uh, present the final uh, target for the second saccadic response. And you see that if this appears merely 10 milliseconds after you, after you acquired the second fixation, you get uh, the strongest inhibition of return. Okay, so maybe you've lost me here. Five minutes, okay, great. Maybe you've lost me here, but the point I'm trying to say is basically that you get an, a, an effect here which is in 
spatial topic coordinates. It's screen coordinates. You, you, you've had your eye movements, and you have biggest effect when the target is in the same position as the cue in screen position, in screen coordinates. Okay. So to summarize till here, what we found was that in most areas, there's a mapping in merely retinotopic coordinates, but in the middle IPS, there's both a retinotopic and a spatiotopic effect. Okay, so all prior to errors in front of us exhibit sensitivity to the vector movement, and we interpret this as a retinotopic uh, mapping, but in the middle IPS, we have also spatiotopic uh, mapping superimposed on this, multiplexed, and then we're, go we're going to M1, it displays sensitivity to both motor and visual aspects of the test, okay? So, and this selectivity is only observed when perception is followed by action. Okay, so what is the uh, story to make from all of this together? So what's the common denominator? The common den den denominator here is that we've made uh, basically a um, distinction between the visual components and the motor components. Okay, so here it's clear, and here it's also clear. In terms of the motor components, you have to uh, basically uh, compute a vector of, uh, of movement for your eyes to acquire the target. So it really, what's important is just the vector, okay? But what we find is that in these areas, it's not only the motor vector or the, the motor component which is uh, effective in basically uh, generating a pattern of response in uh, these areas, but it's also the goal for the future action. So, so in both motor systems, the pattern of activation in some areas reflect the encoding of a goal for future action rather than just the specific movement parameters, that is direction and magnitude, okay? So in other words, the coding of where I wanna get to, which is what we generally think about motor systems, right? It's only coding of where to move the, the, the effector, sorry, that how I'm going to get there is what's relevant for the motor system, but on top of this, we have also a coding of where I want to get to. And this is very much along the line that you have to have basically an interaction between what your uh, action is and what's the goal, okay? So you have to keep in track, okay, also where is the goal for your future action. And this is sort of a, a common denominator to uh, these two works. And I want to thank again the people who were uh, involved, uh, mainly Yoni Pertsov, Leo Shmoilov, and Michal Eisenberg. Thank you very much. So this time for questions, quickly. Uh, nice talk, Woody. I have two questions. The, the first is, um, in your Diamond Circad test, um, you have a, a, an fMRI signal that's different when the monkey ends at a different position. Now. Is that a spatiotopic map, or could that be an eye position signal? Oh. That, that comes later. Okay, okay. Do you want an answer now, or you, yeah, you want to go? Okay, so uh, it, it's as if it, it was planned, because I think one thing, one, one thing to, well, let me just see that yeah, I, it was, planned. it was planned, yeah, yeah. So I think it's not necessarily, it, one should not interpret the results as if w the, what we see in the voxels is that all the neurons in these voxels are what we call real position neurons. And I, I think you know this uh, work by Duhano in which uh, the neurons are sensitive to a position on the screen irrespective of where the fixation here. So fixation in this case is up here, but the fixation here is down and to the right. And you see that generally the receptive field is, all, is the same. But remember, you're looking at the pattern of activity in a given voxel across a million neurons, okay? So what you... Uh, the problem is, of course, that the, this is very sparse. You find maybe f two to three percent of the neurons which have this uh, sort of coding. So we think that the better way to think about this is that what we see is that the voxel represents uh, neurons which have gain fields, okay? And, but they're organized in a specific way. Now, I'm not sure if I have the time for this, but, but, but basically, I'll just say this in two words. Okay, one, in one minute. And the idea is, okay, think about a voxel in which all the neurons are just Gain field neurons. So to remind the audience here, gain field neurons means that they're retinotopic, but their level of activity depends on where you're fixating. So if you're fixating here, okay, the receptive field would be here, but as you're moving here and the receptive field bounces, moves along with it, maybe the, the, the activity would be higher in one position of fixation than another, although the, the receptive field is retinotopic. 
Okay? Now, you could think that uh, at the voxel level, you'd see a spatial what looks like a spatial topic mapping without the actual neurons being spatial topic. And, and what you need for this is, okay, so think about uh, uh, this voxel, in which you have one neuron here whose uh, gain field is here, and another who has a different gain field, okay? But they're all aligned in terms that the uh, position of the target is the same for all of them. So it, it, it's a little difficult, but believe me, uh, it'll take a two, more, two more minutes to explain this, but, but the basic story is that you don't need real position neurons in order to get the effects that we find here. Well, I go back to show about 35 years. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what's the number, but uh, I was in the first group of students that started to work with Shaul at that time. Well, as you heard before uh, regarding Shaul and Peter, Shaul was the only place, the only lab that accepted me coming from physics. It was, not, it was almost impossible to move to biology without redoing all the undergraduate studies, uh, three years of biology, and Shaul was kind enough to take me. And then I had exciting years, a uh, few ex years. I, I don't remember how many, but I submitted my PhD December 82, so that's 30, uh, 30 years next month. And it was about spatial frequency channels in the human visual f system. Uh, we did psychophysics. I think that was the, uh, I mean, we both started psychophysics for Shaul. It was also a new field, and for me, of course, and we had a great time. It was great fun in the Russian comp compound before actually we moved. It was pre-Silverman and uh, all that. So uh, we had great fun and uh, tried many things. Not everything worked. Well, th we had three papers. My favorite, the one I, s I still somehow use or think about is this one, lateral inhibition between spatially adjacent spatial frequency channels. And as you notice, there's a question mark because we, did, we, we couldn't convince the reviewers, but the question mark somehow made it. It was against the dogma, against the uh, receptive dogma. Uh, actually, Bob was speaking about the receptive uh, dogma, and we were going against it, uh, describing some contextual effects that are now they are well known in the literature. And later, in, in fact, Shaul came from Rockefeller very much excited. He was talking about uh, lateral inhibition in the retina. So what we did, we moved up at the hierarchy and introduced lateral inhibition in B1. And I found some visual demonstration that for us, or at least for me, were quite convincing as for the ex existence of uh, lateral inhibition in B1. Uh, the reviews were not that much, but later with Uri Polat, uh, one of my first students that's sitting here. I mean, we made a clear case without question mark about contextual effects in uh, early vision, of course, psychophysics. And this was published in uh, 93, I think. Yeah. So today I'm speaking about perceptual learning, and in particular the claim for low level adult visual plasticity. Somehow we didn't work together on perceptual learning with Shaul, but we ended up uh, during the last. Uh, 20 years, maybe, uh, doing things in parallel, uh, mainly in Shaul, and uh, I'll, so I, I'll start describing some of the work we did 20 years back with Avi Kani, uh, relate to some theories, uh, question the result, present some new result, and put a big question mark on all this concept of lower level adult visual plasticity. So what is well known in visual perception that almost any task you train or you perform discrimination on, on you get better this practice. And this includes a uh, high level task like uh, like face detection, face uh, recognition here in, in noise, uh, and low level task like hyperacuity, like acuity. This is, should be a measure, I mean, the displacement we can detect here should be a measure of our spatial resolution. So that should be related to the retina. And people found oh, in the 70s, uh, probably before the first time, uh, uh, that you can, with practice, you can get very good at it, much better, actually, in kind of sub-pixel resolution, few seconds apart, which was very surprising. 
Uh, there were other studies showing motion, uh, uh, perceptual learning in motion detection, curvature detection. Uh, I, I, I will speak mainly about this low-level task. We were interested in question whether low-level vision can be modified by practice, by, by learning. I mean, the dogma was that uh, there's a critical period, a few months or a few years, and then when you are adult, the visual system cannot change, or at least the uh, early representation. So we, we were using tasks like uh, lateral interaction between Gabo patches with Uri, and with Avi Carney, we produced the uh, texture discrimination task. Uh, the idea here is that in order to detect this pop out, these three lines that are differing by orientation, you need to process the whole thing in parallel, detect all these lines, all these many lines. So it's not possible to scan, to attend to every line, and to detect this, this difference. So it must be done at the early stage of uh, vision, uh, pre-attentively, et cetera, et cetera. So that's well known from the work of Ann Triesman and Bellagos. And of course, if you consider about all these levels of processings that are involved and all these tasks, so I mean, we have now the most influential uh, reverse hierarchy theory by uh, Merav and Shaul that cover all these levels. Things are going up. I mean, there is a stream going up and stream going down high level that deal with low resolution or more complex images and low level that deal with uh, high resolution uh, and low level tasks. And the main issue I'm going to discuss is really whether this low level here, V1 level, V1 like level can be changed with practice or not, or in fact examine the evidence for and against. So again, the task we were using with Avicani in 91, uh, we published this paper where practice makes perfect detection discrimination evidence for primary visual cortex plasticity. And the task is uh, subject need to detect these three lines. And to these three lines could be arranged horizontally or vertically, like presented here. And that's the choice. They need to make the choice between vertical and horizontal. Uh, this was briefly presented. 10 millisecond backward masking, and we measured the time it takes uh, to discriminate, to perform uh, this discrimination. Of course, if the time is very short, it's impossible. If the time is very long, you can do this task perfectly. The subject initially cannot do it, and this practice they improve. So this is described by, uh, OK, here we have a trial, one trial. Okay, it's difficult. You need to practice. Okay, so again, we can. I, I have ten extra minutes, so <laughs> that was it. Okay, so then we obtain psychometric functions. Uh, this is SOA, the time between the target and the mask. Uh, performance level. First day, you need 120 milliseconds between this and this, between target and mask, in order to reach some kind of uh, perf reasonable performance level. The second day, of course, chance level is 50%. So below 120, you are performing a chance level. Above 140 or 130, this subject is, this is a single subject, is perfect. And the next day, he's moving to the left. He's, he can do it faster and faster and faster. After a few days, he can do it with 40 milliseconds. So it's much faster, about a factor of three, sometimes four faster than the initial level of performance. And one of the amazing things here is that this subject's coming back after 32 months without further practice, and he's, again, perfect. So he learns it and never forget. And these are the learning curves we get. First, there's a threshold is 100 milliseconds, under 30, and then improve, improve, and saturate. And this subject, this is another subject. It was tested again about after 22 months, and again, the same level of performance. OK. And another surprising effect here is the locality. You train in one location, and then you, t you move the target to a different location, uh, and you st need to learn again. So you have specificity. And this is one of the main features of uh, perceptual learning specificities to the target location and some other basic features like orientation, eye, and whatever. So this was considered as evidence for low-level visual plasticity, uh, possibly in the primary visual cortex. 
In particular, the I uh, specificity, you train with one I, then you test with the other, and there is no transfer. So this should be at least an indication for learning at the monocular level before the information from the two eyes is being integrated uh, in primary visual cortex. So, I mean, we, we summarize these results uh, uh, describing two stages of learning. I didn't mention the fast learning state, low resolution. Uh, initially, you have a very fast learning, uh, low specificity. We thought this is high level, not too interesting. And there is a slow, le slow learning, high resolution. Between sessions, there is no much learning within a session, but between sessions, high specificity, as I showed, long lasting and depend on sleep. In order to have efficient lear learning, you need to consolidate and sleep on it. So what are the suggested uh, explanations? So the trivial explanation is, uh, well, this is highly specific. So it's probably taking place at location in the brain where these features are encoded, like coding is specific for location, orientation, I, uh, so probably an early representation, uh, V1-like, where all these features are represented separately. That's one possibility. Uh, another possibility is that at the higher level where you get synapses from these specifics or specific representation at some higher level that is <laughs> actually kind of a copy of a low level, so it's not that interesting. A more challenging uh, theory is that learning takes place at the readout. So you have this little guy that's looking at the data. He's trying to figure out what's going on. And it's kind of machine learning approach. So he's looking at the data, improving performance, and getting better. He's just getting better at reading the relevant data, selecting the relevant information. And then the question, why should it be specific? OK? Uh, so one answer coming out, uh, Molon Danilova suggested uh, some time ago, well, it is specific because the early representation uh, is kind of noisy. Uh, what happens? So take consider, for example, the case for hyperacuity. You have two lines here. You, ne you need to take the displacement between them. Now you rely on information coming from photoreceptors. Now photoreceptors arrangement is kind of uh, random. It's not on a regular grid. So you, in order to get really better, in order to improve and get the best you can do, I mean, then you rely on this uh, kind of particular displacement of photoreceptors at these locations. And you create a template for this location. Now, once you move to a different location, uh, everything changed. Suddenly the data is different because the photoreceptors are arranged differently. Uh, maybe it's, or the representation V1 is a different a little bit. The spikes, the synapses, things are coming somehow at a different, in a different way, reaching this decision maker up there in a different way. So then learning is specific. So this can be viewed as a statistical uh, modeling process. Like when you, you try to model your data. So let's say you have some data. You, you do linear regression, and you describe it by the straight line. But then you attempt it to increase the number of parameters. And maybe, well, let's have a second order kind of fit. And then you improve even, uh, you add more parameters, and you get an exact fit to the data. But this is an overfit because you use the same number of parameters as the data. And the cost here is once you get new data, it doesn't match, so you fail. And this is what's called machine learning overfitting, so there is no transfer. And the problem is not because the yellow representation was modified, but rather because you kind of related to too much uh, noise. I mean, you actually fitted the noise. So, uh, in fact, this can be uh, somehow fitted into the reverse hierarchy theory. Uh, 
So this is the same figure of, uh, from Iran 96, but now we say, okay, at the higher level you have coarse fitting, lower dimensionality, and then you go down, you improve uh, actually by overfitting. So you don't need to modify really the, the low level representation. You don't need uh, to have the site of learning here. It's enough that you go down and read the data from the low level and overfit it, and then you get specificity and better performance locally without transfer. And of course, there are many predictions uh, for both the statistical modeling approach and uh, reverse. Uh, actually, very similar predictions like specificity increase with training. You start with kind of a low dimensional fit, and with training, you, you increase dimensionality and you get more specific. Uh, Finding more difficult uh, discrimination lead to more specificity because you go down, you fit with more data, you increase dimensionality, then you overfit and you become specific. And uh, there are many other effects that can be somehow sort of in this context, like uh, pretest or dependence of noise and mixture of stimuli. And mixture of stimuli uh, should reduce overfitting because now you have larger samples, you somehow can cancel out the noise. But I'm not going to go over uh, through all this. So we are back to the original question, improve sensory representation or without? And is there a low level plasticity? So before I answer this question, I want to introduce some other effects that related to learning, uh, more specifically to texture learning. And that's another effect discovered by, or at least uh, reported by Mednik, Nakayama, and Stigold. They, they studied uh, the texture task, uh, texture learning in the context of sleep, and reported that in fact, if you have kind of overtraining, you get worse. So what they did here, they had four sessions in a day. And they found that you start, let's say, at 8 a.m., then you test again at noon. And so, so you do not improve. This is actually means this is increased threshold. So you get worse. OK, so there is some kind of adaptation effect, or texture adaptation, what we call now, that with increasing number of trials, with increasing training, without sleep or without consolidation, you get worse. And of course, you can cancel it by sleep. So, I mean, that was the point that they were making, that if you take a nap, depending on the, le on the length of the nap, you actually stop this adaptation process, and you may get even better or just stay at the same level, depending on the type of sleep you have. Uh, we, we did similar experiments, uh, repeated the result, and basically uh, you get the performance within a session. The more tiles you give subject, actually the performance goes down. So this is counterintuitive because at the end they improve, but during the session after 100 tiles, actually the performance is going down. So this is like, uh, we call the texture adaptation. Uh, this is the result. Uh, I'm not going to present all the results, but summarize it. And this is a result of dense stimulation. It's probably local in the sense of specificity uh, to stimulus feature, but intrinsically it transfers between the eyes. So you adapt with one eye and then you, you test with the other eye and the adaptation effect transfers. So this means <coughs> that this is cortical. This is definitely not retinal. And this is very similar to sensory adaptation effect like contrast adaptation that we know uh, for many experiments uh, in vision, which I'll relate to it in a minute. But before that, I want to mention also the disadaptation effect actually interact with learning and go against learning. So if you have too much adaptation, uh, this is the amount of learning measured with different lengths of session, different session lengths. So this is a long session. We tested morning, evening, and then again the next morning to test whether there's a difference between uh, some sleep effect or day and night. So if you have 800 tiles, uh, then there is no significant learning. So you cannot improve. If you have too many tiles in a session, actually, you do not get better. If you reduce the number of tiles, you improve during the night, but not during the day. So you improve overnight, which means uh, you depend on sleep. And if you have small number of tiles, you improve during the day and during the night. 
So it seems that the role of sleep, at least in some cases, is to reduce this adaptation effect or counteract this adaptation effect, which is consistent with different th theories of normalization of during uh, synaptic normalization uh, during sleep. So one speculation we have here is that these effects relate to sensory adaptation uh, to these classifiable effects of contrast adaptation like Blakemore and Campbell, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which uh, there are two types of effects. One is if you adapt to these gratings, this direction, you get a selective increase in threshold or reduced sensitivity to this orientation in this spatial frequency or this width of stripes. Another is the tilt after effect, which you can experience since we have time. So uh, basically, you, you need to move your eyes uh, along this bar. So you adapt to these two gratings. We can do it for a minute or so. So just move your eyes here. And then you look here, and then this grating should be should look tilted. Yes? No? Yeah. It works. Should. I mean. uh, in the other direction. So this one is tilted this direction, and this one is tilted this direction as a result of adapting to this orientation. Of course, it means also that it's local because you get different adaptation at the, 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 the upper field and the low, lower field. And this is a well-known effect. Uh, and we believe that this is somehow related uh, to what we see in textual learning, somehow this adaptation due to overexposure, which is task independent, uh, caused this, this reduced uh, performance in the texture discrimination task and acts against learning. Now, interestingly, uh, there was a report uh, by uh, Greenlee and Magnussen, uh, 1988, that you can reduce adaptation effect by adapting concurrently to two orientation, uh, differing by uh, 45 degrees. So now, instead of watching this one all the time, you just scan all this. This should reduce adaptation effect. Somehow, magically, it's not clear why, but probably due to some lateral inhibition between the orientations, somehow you get reduced adaptation to this. Uh, what they did, four second vertical, four second diagonal, four second vertical, four second di diagonal, and got much less adaptation which didn't work with vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. So this is a selective effect. Probably has to do with interaction between adjacent orientations like 45 degrees. And this is the result. This is the maximum adaptation effect. Now, if you mix the, the vertical is 45, you get much less. This is, these are log units. So it, it, adaptation effect is very strong. It's about half log units here, the factor of three. These effects are enormous. And if you mix the vertical with diagonal, you get much less. But if you mix the vertical with horizontal, then you get the, some intermediate level of adaptation. So this is a nice fact. And we thought maybe we can use it uh, to remove adaptation effect during practice. So this is what we did uh, with Hila Harris. She's sitting here. Uh, it came out, uh, it was published last month in Current Biology, and uh, it's a very nice paper. Uh, so we designed, we just did the same ex texture experiment, uh, not exactly the same, very similar, uh, adding some uh, dummy trials to remove adaptation. So now, uh, we are, these are the texture display again. Uh, you have this, diag this is a target, this diagonal target, and it can be vertical or horizontal. Uh, so we had the same type of training, but added in between trials some dummy tiles, no target, but the, the orientation, it's a uniform texture. The orientation of this texture is 45 degrees from the target. So now you, you have a target, 45 degrees from the target, and the prediction is that if you have really the same type of process that operate during sensory adaptation with a cancellation of 45 degrees, then uh, this adaptation effect that you see in learning 
uh, should disappear, and then we should be able to see what happens to learning without adaptation. And of course, there are two, I mean, I mean, we could use uh, horizontal and vertical texture. Both of them are 45 degrees from the target. And we used also the orthogonal one, that's which state again. And these are the results. So what we see here, learning curves uh, for the stimuli I just described, uh, the, the empty symbols uh, for the standard uh, training with, uh, with adaptation. And you see, I mean, we, we have three points per day, four days. So you see that subjects start here somewhere and then get wool, I mean, and then saturate. Next day, they start here, they improve, and they get worse. Okay, and we have two curves like that. Uh, uh, the difference is just the time between trials. And then they converge to some kind of low, uh, high sensitivity region, low thresholds. And once you move the target to a different location, performance get back to the original performance level. So this means specificity. But the other condition, without adaptation, so they learn much faster. As you can see, these field symbols, they improve much faster. There's a smooth improvement get the same level of performance, and then when you move them to a new location, then you see clear transfer. And there are a few other conditions. Well, I'm not going to describe all of them, but basically it is, uh, this is uh, what we see here. That's the first measurement, the last measurement, and the transfer. So this means that this is, this is standard case, uh, specific. Uh, here we had more time between trials, just one of the controls. Uh, it's again specific. Here we had minus 45, we get transfer, learning, transfer, plus, 40 f plus, plus 45, learning, transfer. And this is where the dummy trials, the interleaved trials were 90 degrees away from the target. And we get specificity as predicted by the Greenlee and the Magnussen uh, experiment. So this looked like a magi magic. And there are more conditions. and if you, we put all this data together, summarize all the adapting and non-adapting condition, then again, the empty symbols are the adapting condition, and you clearly see the adaptation effect is in session, one, two, three, day one, one, two, three, day two, and then you saturate and without adaptation, there is smooth learning curve. Without adaptation, there is clear transfer. With adaptation, there is specificity. And interestingly, they end up at the same level of performance. So it's possibly end up with the same type of template or the same type of machinery that is build, being built during learning. So I mean, it's difficult to argue that these are two different processes. And, and also, they start from the same, same level of performance. So to conclude, uh, perceptual learning can be very specific to visual features represented in lower level visual areas. There is a strong negative interaction between learning and processes involved in sensory adaptation. Uh, learning is non-specific when adaptation is avoided, faster and accurate. Sleep may help, help to generalize counter by time counteracting adaptation. So what is the post so explanation? I mean, this requires some kind of theory or some type of framework which we need to develop, but it requires major change uh, in the view of perceptual learning. And uh, so what the story we tell now is goes like that. Uh, during textual learning, local lower level networks are being modified by adapt adaptive processes operating on a time scale of a few seconds. So this is standard adaptation that's taking place in the visual cortex. There's psychophysical evidence and, of course, the electrophysiology and the fMRI. We all know that there is something going on there, uh, reduced sensitivity, etc. Now, there is a readout mechanism which classifies the neuronal activity according to the possible stimuli. So this is a small guy up the hierarchy 
that looks at the low level representation and tries to figure out what's going on there. And special gener generalization depends on the degree to which the neuronal code learned at one location is space invariant. Okay, so if the representation to ev everywhere in V1 is the same, uh, the same type of orientation cells or whatever, they are arranged the same way, they produce the same spike terms, then you get transfer. But if you get some variability, then you get specificity. So then the solution is, uh, in the absence of sensory adaptation, the code is space invariant. But adaptation induces local network properties which prevent generalization. So what happens during adaptation probably are kind of lateral interactions, uh, like the first paper I mentioned with Shaul, lateral inhibition between special frequency, between receptive field comes in, and these introduce some noise in the representation of or variability in the representation of uh, the V1 units. Without it, without adaptation or without this inhibitory uh, processes, uh, the code is space invariant. And by that, in fact, we move the learning up to the top of the hierarchy to this readout mechanism. Thank you. Well, but there was missing evidence for uh, plasticity in V1. I mean, very, very little and very in weak. In MT, there was very little uh, ah, plasticity. Okay. Long-term plasticity. No, I mean, MT of course you have high level, of course you have learning. I mean, I mean, yeah. this, <laughs> I mean we remember the past somehow, right? So, I mean, th that's not a big surprise. Uh, it surprises. No, but the surprise is why do you, if you are able to have this plasticity at high level, why can't you have it at the lower level? I don't know. So that was the original thought. Why not? I mean, the dogma is, was that yeah. no. Well, you don't want to change the early representation too often, right? You don't want to make commitment unless the, real, the, the environment really changes, right? But there should be some kind of basic uh, representation which you can trust. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So we're done a bit early. Yeah. <laughs>